The following is rated M for mature audiences. I am for immature audiences. PW for please watch. It's late. Settle in and get comfortable. Let's go. It really happened. The Clippers landed the top prize of the free agent class and then some. Kawhi Leonard is on his way to L.A. He chose the Clippers and they're getting the finals MVP for the next four seasons. Not only that, Kawhi wanted Paul George to join him. So PG is coming to LAC after a blockbuster trade. Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, the Clippers. Yes, the Clippers are now the favorite to win the NBA championship. That has never happened, but team owner Steve Ballmer is going for it. They've got the talent. They've got the coach. They've got a real shot to obliterate every notion of the Clippers we've ever had. How did they do it and where does this leave the Lakers? The answers are coming right up. The City of Angels still asking why and how, but there's nothing I could ask that these two can't answer. From AM570 LA Sports, the proud radio home of the Clippers. Guess you have more to talk about now. It is Tim Cates. And if you're asking who's going to speak the truth, well, <laughs> this man is going to. Nick Hamilton is here to tell it like it is. Not like you're not going to tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. Are you surprised that the Clippers actually pull this off? I am. I'm surprised that they pulled it off in the fashion that they did, that they are able to get both Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. The fact that they went out and got Paul George and, and delivered him behind the scenes, under the radar, stealth mode, however you want to describe it, what this ownership and Steve Ballmer with this front office, with Jerry West Consulting and Michael Winger and Lawrence Frank, what they were able to do, not only just getting Kawhi Leonard here, but – Getting Paul George, sealing the deal when nobody saw that coming. Nobody knew what was going on for a good 72 hours until Friday night. The earth shakes in Southern California, and then they're both here. Yeah, they're both here, but here's the two. Here's the testament also, too. This was a process in the making. This was not as quiet as everybody wanted to, to know about because here's the thing. They have been courting Kawhi much like a dude is courting his wife to be. And so when I look at it, you look at all the games. You look at the scouting department. You look at they had the, the, the nice little Clipper logos on their, on their polo shirts. I mean, this was a process in the making. But also, too, you have to give credit not only to, to uh, Jerry West and not only to the owner, Steve Ballmer, but you got to give credit to Kawhi Leonard because Kawhi could have did the same thing that Elton Brand did many, many years ago and say, yeah, I'm going to come here and then bounce out to another team. So Kawhi Leonard it gets a lot of credit. Also, but the Clippers would not be in the mix, like you said, without a Paul George and making sure they can be able to get Paul George. And then they had to sacrifice, unfortunately, Shea Alexander. Yeah, they, they, there was a price to yep. pay. So to get Paul George, they gave up five first round picks, two swaps, Shea Gilders Alexander, Danilo Gallinari, a huge haul, but they had to do it, right? They did. There was and, no other way. If you want to get Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, you had to pull the trigger on this deal. You had to give up probably more than you wanted to give up, but a lot of that's pick. Giving up Shea Gillis Alexander, that's going to hurt because he's a good young player. But it's Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. I think a lot of people don't realize how good Paul George was last year, Nick. He was top three in the MVP vote getting. He was top three in scoring. He was top three in field goals made per game. He was number one in the NBA in steals. This is a guy who averaged 28 points a game last year. This isn't just a throw-in because Kawhi wanted a boy there with them. But they also have to remember this. In the Western Conference, this is a two-star conference. You had to get somebody else to, because the Clippers would never been e even in the running if they couldn't get that second star. Yeah, like so to be able to be in this Western Conference and say, you know, if we're going to compete with the Lakers, Golden State, Houston, Utah, we have to bring in another star along with that nucleus and a Hall of Fame coach in Doc Rivers. So the Clippers had a lot riding on this bet, and they put all their chips in, <laughs> and so far it's worked out for them. We'll see what happens this season. And how things have changed. The, the, the power shift is incredible. Two wow. years ago, there was only one team in town. No one can touch the Warriors. Now the Clippers are favorites to win the NBA championship, according to Vegas. Should they be the favorite? Well, you're going to let me borrow some money, Mario. I'm going to put it down on the Clippers <laughs> to win it all this year. Absolutely. Well, you, apparently you want to lose some money because there's no way in the world I'm going to put all my money on the Clippers right now. This is not a paper championship. They have to play it within the 94 feet. There is 82 games plus playoffs, and I'm still not going to bet necessarily against the Clippers, but I'm not going to cash all my chips into the Clippers. There's a team called the Los Angeles Lakers that yeah. uh, did some improvements yeah, as well. Old, though. Hello? Old. Come on. It doesn't old. matter. Whatever night you go to Staples, it's going to be a terrific 
terrific season down in downtown LA because it's not just the Clippers as you mentioned Nick the Lakers have a couple of big stars as well LeBron James Anthony Davis might be two of the top five players in the game so you know the Lakers have a real shot they held out for Kawhi while 90% of the free agents came off the board at the last minute, they pulled in DeMarcus Cousins on a one-year deal. Danny Green moving in from Toronto. Jared Dudley also on his way. And they re-signed Contavious Caldwell-Pope, Rajon Rondo, JaVale McGee, and Alex Caruso. They could have uh, put this team together a week ago when free agency hit, but they decided to wait for Kawhi. Was that the right move, Nick? Uh, you know what? At the time, it was the right move because you're going to get the, the best two-way player in the game. You have a chance to create a big three yourself in the NBA. Why wouldn't you wait for Kawhi Leonard? Kawhi Leonard is coming off an NBA championship, giving Toronto their first ever championship. This guy's the best in the game, knows how to deal with his body, knows how to uh, – solid basketball IQ. So why wouldn't you do it? But then at the same time, it did hurt you somewhat because you missed out on a lot of players like a Seth Curry, like other players like that, when you needed shooters to surround LeBron James with. But the Lakers are the Lakers. They're finding a way to get the job done. Let's face it. They were a Paul George straight away from getting Kawhi Leonard on their team and having three superstars for the Lakers next season. The fact they didn't get him and the, sh the show how quickly – they signed seven or eight guys within 13 hours after this trade that was announced by uh, the Clippers I mean, and, and the pickup of Kawhi Leonard. They had plan B ready to go. They had all these dudes ready to go. Jared Dudley, all these guys, they were all lined up in case Kawhi didn't come. All right, so he uh, Kawhi ends up meeting with the Lakers and uh, – Silently, he is meeting also. He changed the, 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 the meeting uh, rendezvous point, right? Ends up talking to, to PG, and they make this uh, deal to go with the Clippers. What was the worst move the Lakers made during this uh, free agency uh, period and uh, as they waited for uh, Kawhi as well? Well, to me, the worst move could have been KCP and Jared Dudley because here's the thing. KCP is a guy that he's a nice player, but can you count on him game in and game out? I don't think you can. And then Jared Dudley, he's older. We saw what he did in, in, with the, against the Sixers with, with the Brooklyn Nets in the playoffs. I'm not impressed by that. I think they could have done much better as it pertains to getting quality guys at this point in time with the Los Angeles Lakers. They have the money. They have the ideas. They have the plans. Why would you spend money on KCP? I'm convinced. Maybe he has something on hey, LeBron and Rich you. Paul. <laughs> Maybe he has Nick, something on Rich Paul. Maybe much, much like we were trying to figure out with Marvin Lewis why he was still employed with the Cincinnati Bengals. Maybe he has some pictures, some I'm video. I don't know. I'm with but it's obviously – mind-boggling to think that this guy still gets a paycheck when he should be paying them. Hey Amen. I'm with you. I don't know how this guy is still getting paid 10, 12, 15 million dollars a year. I mean, Rob Plinko was his agent, but you got to cut the cord. You don't have to steep, keep paying the guy and overpaying him. He's not worth it. He played 82 games, but not worth what they're paying. So based on this roster, where do the Lakers end up um, in the Western Conference? They're a top four team, I think. I mean, the, the West is loaded still. You mentioned the injury to Golden State. Utah's very good. But to me, this is a top four team when they're all healthy because when LeBron's healthy, when Anthony Davis is healthy, when, when Kyle Kuzma's healthy, this is still a very good team. Yeah. They're not going to win the West. The Clippers are going to win the West. But the Lakers are certainly a top four team. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I won't go <laughs> off that, that much. But I will say this. The Clippers, excuse me, the Lakers are a top four team. And I think they can win the West if they stay healthy. I mean, the West is going to be a balance shift. I mean, you, again, you have, a lot of teams that are combining for position. Remember, last season, the West was it was tighter than the Beyonce jumpsuit, and especially in the first half. So we don't know what's going to happen now that you actually have quality stars in these different markets with these different teams, especially with the Lakers having a two, a two top five players in LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Yeah, I mean, injury. Damian Lillard, Damian Lillard goes down in Portland. They're not a playoff team. You know, we saw what happened with the Lakers yeah. and, and LeBron James a year ago. Playoff team, then not a playoff team when he gets hurt. All right, we'll see what uh, the Lakers can do with this roster. And now that the free agency period is complete, who came out on top and who's coming out on top next season? That's coming up. Time to pay tribute to a young man that was the best he could be. One last goodbye for a local legend. Tyler Skaggs was born in Woodland Hills, went to Santa Monica High, had a fantastic junior season, named Ocean League Player of the Year. An upbeat young man with a fabulous fastball. The Angels drafted him in the first round in 2009. It was a dream come true to join the team he rooted for growing up. After being traded to Arizona, he came back to the Angels organization, spent the last six seasons in Anaheim. 
Manager Brett Osmus told him he thought he could be an all-star, and Tyler was all smiles with his teammates. He was fun, full of joy, one of the most vibrant personalities on the team. This week, the Angels lost one of their own, and now there's another angel up in heaven. From Santa Monica High to forever in our hearts, Tyler Skaggs is this week's local legend. Gentlemen, Rihanna reminding us it is time for the game that is sweeping the nation. We're going to give you some clues, show you some pictures, and all you have to do is uh, guess which Southern California sports figure we are talking about. Here is your first clue. I was born in San Dimas. Man, we just pretty much gave it away. I know. <laughs> Alex Morgan. Whoa. You got it. I won. Wow. You See, I told a, you. You should be in a different yeah. business. You should Here's be in the, the fortune telling business. He got yeah. it. I told right, you. So I, I told him. I told him. I said, you're going to get this. I'm 0 for 3 now. I, I was more surprised than the Kauai decision. But, <laughs> man, whatever. Born in San Dimas, a star at Diamond Bar High, PETA's most beautiful vegan celebrity for 2019, along with Kyrie Irving, won a gold medal in 2012. Her husband plays for the Galaxy. And now she's a two-time World Cup champion, won the silver boot as the second best player in the World Cup after the American women beat the Netherlands 2 to nothing. Yes, it is Alex Morgan. I, I just kind of put two and two together. I, I thought maybe it's got to be somebody from the World <laughs> Cup team. And quite frankly, all I know is Alex Morgan. She's from Southern California. That was just a, literally Lucky a throw guess, out right? there. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I was born in San Dimas. I mean, that's the case. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Exactly. Hey, maybe she's going to get to throw out maybe the uh, first pitch at Dodger Stadium soon. And, well, she should. Other than this last series, almost everything going the Dodgers' way in the first half of the season. Rookies hitting walk-off homers, walk-offs in every way imaginable. Even a walk-off walk. They're the best team in baseball at the break. And this year's Dodgers had that feeling, you know. They, they win in different ways, have an MVP candidate in Cody Bellinger. And all-star starter Hunjin Ryu could be this year's Cy Young winner. If they get to the World Series, perhaps a third time will be the charm. Tim. We're halfway done. You host Dodger pregame and postgame shows. How different is this team from the last two seasons? It's not a lot different than last year's team. For this reason, last year's team battled through injuries. Corey Seager went out with the Tommy John surgery. You had Hyunjin Ryu had that torn groin muscle. Clayton Kershaw was on the DL a couple of times. Rich Hill got hurt. The same thing happened this year. They started the season with two-fifths of their starting rotation on the IL. Then three-fifths of their starting rotation went on the IL in the first month of the season. Seager's been hurt. A.J. Pollock, who they signed in the offseason, got hurt. In comes Matt Beatty, in comes Kyle Garlick, in comes Will Smith. Guys who you've never heard of, or maybe you did, but didn't think they'd be here in 2019. The fact is, guys have come in and they plugged in. Game here, walk off here, a start here, an appearance here on the bullpen. Just like last year, guys have stepped in, their roles have been increased. Alex Verdugo, Chris Taylor, with, Al with, with, with Corey Seager out, has stepped in, hitting over 350. Guys have elevated their games, and for that reason, because of the injuries, the similarities of last year, but for the difference is, you've got guys now, they have got so much depth, Nick, they've got so much depth, pitching, bullpen, position players. Will Smith came and find a spot on this roster, yet he's probably the best catcher this season. No, I agree. I think you have to look at all those, including Alex Verdugo. Yeah. But Alex Verdugo has yeah. definitely been a guy that you have to center your eyes on because you don't know what this guy's going to do if you're an opponent. And then also, too, you have to look at – I look at the starting rotation, but, but the thing that questions me is still – the, the closer. I look at Kenley Jansen who struggled. Joe Kelly just started to come on and kind of find his way. So can he continue to find his way in the second half of the season? But that the, the, the Achilles heel of this Dodger team is going to be the closer. It's going to be Kenley Jansen and company. Can they close out ball games, especially tight ball games, when they have the lead? Because when you start going into the playoffs, we all know it's a crapshoot. But when you start playing in the playoffs and getting teams on the, on the fence, can you deliver the knockout blow? And that's what questions me about the Dodgers. Two of the guys that have really sh uh, are sh are, have been shining this year, Cody Bellinger, Hunjin Ryu, whose performance has surprised you the most? It's got to be Hunjin Ryu because, remember, he came back on a one-year deal. He could have left uh, and, and gone somewhere else on a two- or three-year deal. He decided to come back and prove that he can do what he did last year when healthy for an entire season. And that's why he's going to start the All-Star game on Tuesday night. That's why he's going to be the Cy Young Award winner if he can do in the second half what he did in the first half of the best ERA in baseball. He did it last year, but remember, he was out for three months with a torn groin muscle. When he was healthy last year, he was really good. He just didn't get enough starts. But now that he's healthy, 
it, it, to me, it's not really a big surprise, but yet it is that he's well, doing what he's doing. I mean, I have to agree. Hyunjin Ryu, to me, I thought, listen, I'm going to admit it right here on TV. I was wrong about Hyunjin Ryu. <laughs> I thought he was shot. I thought he was done. I thought his arm was done. And lo and behold, I don't know what happened, some miracle, whatever it was, Hyunjin Ryu has, has pretty much turned his career around enough to say, you know what? I'm back. I'm a starter. And not only am I a starter in the Nas- for the National League in the All-Star game, but I can be uh, whatever I want to be as far as leading this team to victory. So, again, I have to say, Hunjin Ryu, I'm thoroughly impressed. My hat's off. All right. Well, we'll see what happens in the postseason. Totally different monster. The Dodgers, not done yet, and neither are you, gentlemen. It's time for Rapid Fire. All right, baseball's all-star game is Tuesday. Let's put two minutes on the clock. Does the game even interest you, Nick? Are you going to watch? No. For what? <laughs> what am I going to watch? I'm, I'm still burned out from NBA free agency. I don't have time to sit up here Tim, and watch the, watch the game. No, because remember, really? it used to count for something. Now it doesn't count for anything. Not even the watching. derby? No, no, I don't care. I will watch the derby, no, though. The derby is actually fun right? to watch. Oh, let's watch millionaires try to make another million dollars in a home run derby. <laughs> hey, you sound oh, salty, you. Tim. What's going on? Let's do a little soccer. Okay, the jealous. U.S. women won the, 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 the World Cup again. You almost expect them to win at this point, right? Like, it's, it's already sort of uh, in the cards. I mean, American women's soccer kind of is the fourth front of all of soccer as far as women's concerned we should win it every year we should win it every year and if, if, the well, thing about every it four but yeah well yeah every four years mean. excuse me every four <laughs> years but also too you got you have to credit the people that put the teams together they have an excellent scouting department they know how teams have to gel and the chemistry is the key that's why they've been so successful every four years all right back to the nba now that the free agent frenzy has made over half the nba rosters it's uh, way too early, but which teams are you picking to make the finals? I, I know, and we said power <laughs> shift is incredible. Really? I mean, is, are we going to give paper championships away? I mean, come on, it's, we haven't even finished the summer league, for God's sakes. I don't know what team's going to do well, but I do know that the Lakers and the Clippers have excellent opportunities to do well. We could get a Western Conference Finals, a hallway series, and what Ooh. ironic it would be Ooh, would for be. the 20th year anniversary yeah. of Staples Center. We've never had a hallway series, and now all of a sudden we could have it. I mean, it's something magical about 20. If you're in Milwaukee, get ready. The NBA Finals are coming your way next June. They'll be taking on the Clippers. Right on. Patrick Beverly turned down more money from Sacramento to come back to the Clippers. How much do you love that move? Sacrificing money. Nobody does that. No, Patrick Beverly does that. Lou Williams does that. Because of the Clippers. They're the hardcore Clippers, as Steve Ballmer said. <laughs> These are the blue-collar Clippers. I don't know if I would turn down any kind of money because the Clippers haven't really won anything, so I would kind of be faulty at saying. But then again, my God, it's Sacramento. It's the Kings. I would turn down money for that, too. To go to the Clippers. I'm in LA. I'm, I got the women. I got the weather. I mean, come on. We all know the rest. Hey, you guys have been here a while. Probably getting a little hungry. Joey Chestnut ate 71 hot dogs at uh, Nathan's, uh, you know, annual eating uh, hot dog contest on July the 4th. How many could you guys eat in 10 minutes? I've actually tried this. It was a dumb radio stunt really? about 11 years ago, <laughs> and I got eight. I got eight hot dogs. The in ten minutes. The bun. The right. bun is what really gets you. And then if you put condiments on it, like ketchup and mustard, well, yeah. you should never put ketchup on a hot dog. But the condiments get you. Are you Tell kidding me? You can me? do more than eight. I could probably do about six if they're Dodger dogs. If they're not Dodger dogs, I really don't deal you with put them. Ketchup on your hot dog? Yes, of course. Why not? Why what, not? What are you, Tim? an eight-year-old kid? No, I'm a grown man that likes ketchup on his hot you dog. You should never Come put on. ketchup on your hot What's dog. What's wrong with you? How about some oh bacon around here? You guys can go. You don't like any flavor, huh? You just, you're not, you're not, you're not with any flavor, huh? You just want it plain. No, just, I, just. I, I want some onions. I want some relish. Oh and I want my some mustard. God. Time to get one with maybe a little bacon around it, Tim. Guys, Tim. Nick, nice job tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, man. You know that hype around women's soccer. It's nothing new. 20 years ago, the sport took Southern California by storm. Team USA won the Women's World Cup, finishing off China on that Brandy Chastain penalty kick at the Rose Bowl. And the celebration was on. We're opening up the vault as Fred goes back two decades with the ladies that put U.S. soccer on the map. This is how the heroes of a new age ended their triumphant tour of Southern California. She's the best, Mia Hamm. And this is the tender age when it all started. It's Little League Soccer played on fields all over the Southland. See a future Mia Hamm or Julie Foudy out there? She started playing at age seven for what team, Julie? The Mission Bay Soccerettes. No, 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 nobody messes with the green mission. But when she outgrew the soccer fields of Southern California, the world had not outgrown a traditional view of female athletes. 
The community I grew up in obviously was very geared towards women's athletics in, in Mission Viejo. It wasn't until I started traveling with the national team, we started playing abroad, that I was like, wow, you know, it, not everyone plays soccer, you know, and they, you know, you go abroad and they'd be like, you're a woman and you play football? No, no, you know, and they thought you were a freak. But Saturday, Team USA may have changed that view. On the last penalty kick of the match, Northern California native Brandy Chastain scored the game winner and sent a message to a new generation. We're doing this for you. Uh, we're setting the foundation. This is something that we're giving to you as a gift. Please enjoy it, have passion, and, and, and run with it. This morning, Chastain and her teammates enjoyed the spoils of their triumph. Disneyland greeted them with all the might a Main Street parade could muster. Well, it was funny, you know, walking through, I'm like, you know, I remember having my picture taken there with my two sisters and, and going on this ride and remember thinking, well, that was too scary. Couldn't go on the Matterhorn when I was little, but this was awesome. You watched the parades growing up and now you were actually part of the parade. Uh, it was amazing. After Disney, the team moved to a reception of friends and media at the convention center. We caught Chastain's first glimpse of her headline-grabbing goal and shirtless celebration. Well, the crazy things you do in the name of sports, I guess. <laughs> then they moved outside, where over a thousand adoring fans awaited. It was one last chance to embrace the heroes of a new age. You know, to be a hero, that's a pretty big name. I, you know, we, we don't save anybody's lives. We don't, you know... We don't put ourselves on the line for anybody, but I think what we are is we're champions of sport and we're champions of uh, women's athletics, and, and we really want to see young girls strive to be the best they can be. Are you still watching? Good. You're the best. Email us here at goingrogan at NBCUni.com or hit me up, Mario NBCLA on IG, Twitter, or Facebook. We'll see you next time, and remember, wherever you go, keep going Rogan.